I'm going to tell you something crazy. I never told anyone this before. But honestly, I'm not sure I can remember what my mother looked like. It really seems like my whole life, Katara's been the one looking out for me. She's always been the one that's there. And now, when I try to remember my mom, Katara's is the only face I can picture. This is the scene which a lot of people forget when drawing comparisons between Katara's portrayal of grief in the Southern Raiders versus Aang's grief, or even Sokka's grief. Hello everyone, and welcome back to my channel, where we will again be taking another look at Avatar The Last Airbender, specifically the sixth to last episode of the show, The Southern Raiders. It's an episode which is significant for finally bringing the internal arc of Katara, the show's female deuteragonist and primary audience surrogate, to a climax and a resolution. It's also the one episode where Katara's portrayal has been met with mixed reviews, shall we say. Here, take this. What's in here? I've often heard arguments painting Katara as unreasonable, unjustifiably cruel, selfish, acting out of character, blinded by darkness and rage, allowing herself to succumb to her baser instincts, or even letting herself be swayed by the influence of a certain scarred individual who doesn't have her best interests at heart. In contextualizing Katara's choices and actions in this episode, I believe that there are two separate factors which these arguments tend to overlook. So today, that's what we're going to be talking about. Buckle in. The first thing that's important to understand is that Katara has always been the gang's designated healer, even before she discovered that she literally had healing abilities. Katara is the empath of the group, the first to notice someone else's pain, the first to offer comfort, the first to lend a shoulder to cry on. And not only does she do all of these things, but there are also multiple scenes in Avatar where Katara prioritizes someone else's well-being, seemingly over her own. The Desert is probably the fandom's go-to episode to demonstrate this particular aspect of Katara's personality. Katara's patience, selflessness and resilience practically speaks for itself, whether it's when she offers the last of her bending water to the rest of the group and isn't shown to take a single sip from it herself, or when she responds to Aang's accusational outburst with, let's just say, a lot more tolerance and humility than the average person in her situation would be expected to. Wow, there's hardly any in here. I'm sorry, okay? It's a desert cloud, I did all I could. What's anyone else doing? What are you doing? Trying to keep everyone together. Let's just get moving. We need to head this direction. When the episode concludes with Aang entering the Avatar state, ready to inflict terrifying wrath and devastation onto the sandbenders who stole Arpa from him, Katara is also the only character who stays by his side the only one who doesn't flinch from his uncontrollable rage, the only one both willing and able to soothe his violent fury. Less remembered than the desert, though in my opinion no less meaningful, is the immediately following episode, The Serpent's Pass. Keep in mind that at this point, I think it's fair to say that Katara's selflessness and unyielding forbearance is probably the only reason any of them are still alive, and one might think it reasonable for Katara to receive some recognition, perhaps even a little bit of gratitude from the rest of the group, for all her tireless efforts in keeping them alive and safe, not least because she'd even been accused of not doing enough. But if Katara receives any acknowledgement at all, it happens off screen. Indeed, Katara spends much of this episode fulfilling the same role she played in the previous one, tirelessly looking after the well-being of those around her, especially Aang, who Katara takes particular care to be kind, empathetic, and sensitive to. I mean, it's not like we have Appa to fly us there. Shush up about Appa. Can't you at least try to be sensitive? And this isn't the first time that the narrative has treated Katara this way. Way back in Season 1, Episode 16, in a moment of carelessness and poor judgement, Aang's overconfidence in his newfound firebending ability results in Katara getting burned. This event severely demoralizes Aang and takes away all desire to even attempt firebending ever again, and while the narrative is clear in suggesting that Aang is deeply remorseful for hurting Katara, ultimately it's Katara who ends up comforting and reassuring a miserable and guilty Aang, 
not the other way around. It's Katara, the one who was actually hurt, who, once again, dismisses her pain to console Aang. I'm never gonna firebend again. You'll have to eventually. No, never again. It's okay, Aang. I'm healed. Okay, here's where I should probably clarify something right now, which isn't really conducive to my main argument, but I feel like something I should probably make clear nonetheless. I'm really not trying to be critical here of Aang as a character. Like, this isn't something that really happens so much anymore, but unfortunately, this is just one of those things that didn't used to be all that uncommon for female deuteragonists, especially if they were written as the canonical love interest of the male lead. This is really not so much an issue with Aang specifically, so much as it is a product of the way female characters tended to be treated in the media they appeared in, especially if they are love interests, or brown, or both. The point is, for all that Katara suffers and tolerates and labours after the emotional well-being of everyone around her, Katara herself rarely gets to lay bare the depths of her vulnerability before her friends. For all her endless patience and kindness, she rarely gets to be the comforted instead of the comforter. Whenever the focus in Avatar narrows in on the pain, anger, disappointment, or resentment, or even serious trauma of one of the main characters in our loyal gang of five, it's usually someone else's pain, someone else's bitterness, someone else's trauma that Katara is soothing and healing. I think the episode that gets closest to reversing this dynamic, in actually allowing Katara a chance to work through some of her raw emotions with the help of her friends, is The Runaway. And even in that episode, Sarka's words which brought her some much needed solace and consolation were not actually said to her face. When our mom died, that was the hardest time in my life. Our family was a mess. But Katara, she had so much strength. She stepped up and took on so much responsibility. She helped fill the void that was left by her mom. It's honestly up to interpretation whether Katara even knew that she was actually meant to hear them. And for the rest of the show, Katara's sorrows, her anguish, her rage, her trauma, her feelings almost always take a backseat to those of her friends, surfacing briefly only to be suppressed, bringing her to her knees only when she is alone, drawing her tears only when no one else can see them. Until, of course, the Southern Raiders. The Southern Raiders is the first time that Katara's feelings and needs truly take center stage. For the first time, we have an episode that is almost entirely dedicated to addressing Katara's unresolved trauma, to relieving her burdens, to soothing her pain. For once, it is Katara's emotional journey that the show now invites us to accompany her on and see her through with, in all of its messy, rueful, heart-wrenching intensity. For the first time, Katara's flipping the script, and it's her darkness that we are meant to be sensitive towards. I knew you wouldn't understand. And I grant that this is all a very new experience, particularly the cold or even cruel manner in which Katara seems completely dismissive towards Aang and Sokka's objections. Then you didn't love her the way I did! <gasps> Oh, that's not very nice. But here's a wild thought, right? <laughs> Just humor me for a second. As harsh as they may be, I, I have to wonder, could there actually be some truth behind Katara's harsh words of rebuke? Katara, she was my mother too. But I think Aang might be right. How comparable is Katara's grief, actually, to Sokka's? And is Aang actually being fair when he compares his loss of Appa or his loss of his people to Katara's loss of her mother? Scandalous questions, I know. Okay, so let's get the basic stuff out of the way first. I think the most obvious, and to some extent maybe shallow points of contention, are ones that don't really go beyond invalidating the Appa comparison, because it's relatively easy to point out, for example, that given Appa was only ever stolen and not killed, Appa's theft and Kaya's murder are not exactly equivalent. And I'm calling out myself here on this too, because I myself made a joke about this in my Zutara video, because, you know, it's, it's low-hanging fruit. It's easy to make fun of. But, in all fairness, I think there is a little more to it than that. 
In the next line, Aang brings up the genocide of his people, and here the parallels seem a lot more salient, at least on the surface. And of course, we also hear Sokka point out that Katara's mother was his mother too. All three of these characters have indeed suffered trauma and loss. And in fact, you could probably make a point that, as a genocide survivor, Aang's experience of grief isn't just on par with Katara's, but perhaps something even greater than hers. But I think that perspective ignores something really crucial about the way that the show has portrayed Katara's grief in comparison to everyone else's thus far. The trauma itself is only a part of it. The other part of it is the impact. If we take a closer look at the way that grief has individually affected Aang, Sokka, and Katara, we might notice that despite having all experienced similar losses, the way each character has been shaped by their trauma is strikingly different. If we're measuring by the sheer magnitude of loss, it's clear that Aang has suffered the most out of the bunch. But what I find interesting is that outside of a few episodes in which Aang's grief is specifically used to create some narrative tension, neither the character nor the show itself feels the need to dwell on it. Aang's grief over the Air Nomads is explicitly brought up and explored three times. First in the Southern Air Temple, where Aang faces the truth of the genocide of his people for the first time. Then in the Storm, where Aang grapples with the complex feelings of guilt and heartache as he blames himself for not being present when the Air Nomads needed him most. And again in The Guru, where Aang is specifically told to confront his feelings of grief in order to let go of it and master the Avatar state. In addition to these episodes, there are also three other episodes in which Aang's loss of his people, while not explicitly mentioned, arguably serve as the subtext driving the episode's central conflict. These would be the Northern Air Temple, in which Aang learns to accept that the ancestral homes of his people will never be the way he remembers them, the desert, in which Arpa, Aang's only living connection to his people, is stolen from him, and the episode immediately following that episode, The Serpent's Pass in which Aang, still reeling from this loss, ultimately learns to allow hope and happiness back into his heart by the episode's end. All of these episodes bring up Aang's grief in a way that is intrinsically linked to the episode's central conflict. We see Aang's grief manifest in such contexts as an episode revealing the true depths of the Fire Nation's evil, an episode revealing the truth behind Aang's hundred-year-long absence, and how his choices may have impacted history, or an episode exploring how Aang's earthly feelings and attachments are preventing him from achieving his true destiny. Most importantly, after introducing and exploring these conflicts, and Aang's grief in relation to them, these conflicts are also ultimately resolved, usually within the same episode because Avatar is, by nature, an episodic show. Katara, I think you were right before. I'm done dwelling on the past. Really? I can't make guesses about how things would have turned out if I hadn't run away. I'm here now and I'm going to make the most of it. I don't think you're going to have those nightmares anymore. This may be sli just slightly a, a radical take, but honestly, the way that the show treats Aang's grief is less of a character trait and almost more of a plot device. And again, I'm really not trying to criticize Aang's character for this, this is more just my observation of the show's storytelling. Outside of specific contexts in which Aang's grief becomes relevant to the plot in some way, the show doesn't otherwise treat Aang's grief as something that shadows him wherever he goes. It isn't something which is shown to impact who he is as a character, or affect how he interacts with the world outside of these specific storylines. Which brings me back to... I'm gonna tell you something crazy. I never told anyone this before. But honestly, I'm not sure I can remember what my mother looked like. It really seems like my whole life, Katara's been the one looking out for me. She's always been the one that's there. And now, when I try to remember my mom, Katara's is the only face I can picture. This is the biggest difference between Katara's loss and Aang's loss, as well as Sokka's loss for that matter. Katara's loss of her mother Kaya wasn't just a grim footnote of her character, it shaped her core identity. In losing Kaya, Katara had to step into her mother's shoes. She had to take on the role of caretaker and nurturer, mending socks and easing hurts, all at the age of eight. I even wash all the clothes! Have you ever smelled your dirty socks? Let me tell you! 
not love it! Katara's loss didn't just transform her worldview, it deeply impacted the way she saw herself as well as how she connected with others around her. It became a core driving force of her ideals, her empathy, her activism, and her inner strength. The Fire Nation took my mother away from me. Unlike Aang and Sokka, the narrative doesn't stop at framing Katara's trauma as merely a tragic backstory. It's also not treated as a plot device, something which is only ever brought up to buttress the episode's core theme and essentially resolve itself by the episode's end. It is, in fact, a huge and enduring part of what makes Katara, Katara. It's why she, you know, bosses the group around and sees to all their emotional needs and cooks and cleans and mends and sews and gets to have lines like this. I haven't done this since I was a kid! You still are a kid! Or this. Can I get some of that cactus? I don't think that's a good idea. Or, you know, this. What do you think, Aang? Do I act like a mom? Well, I... Stop rubbing your eye and speak clearly when you talk. Yes, ma'am. Me being 14 is hard because I have so much responsibility, like, with the kids. And on top of all that, it is specifically the lack of resolution for Katara's trauma that is treated as a recurring theme for her character, not just her trauma itself. It is what she uses to connect with strangers who have also suffered loss, and it's who she sees when she's lost and alone in the mystic depths of the swamp. In exploring Katara's grief, the show gives Katara a deep emotional wound, and ultimately grants her multiple chances to pick at it, but never an actual opportunity to lance it open and let it heal. Not until the Southern Raiders. In rejecting that Aang can understand her pain, or that Sokka loved Kaya the way Katara did, it might be fair to consider her words as unkind, insensitive, or even cruel. But something that I rarely see acknowledged or discussed within these criticisms is the veracity itself of her claims. Because when it comes down to it, even if you find her need to face Yon Ra or her feelings of isolation or invalidation from the reactions of her friends to be not something you can easily empathize with, that was a bit of an awkward sentence. <laughs> even if you struggle to sympathize with Katara here, I honestly can't find it to be completely wrong in her judgment. I'm sure that Aang and Sokka can relate to Katara insofar as they can understand her feelings of loss. They've all experienced loss. But to be completely honest, I think that's as far as their empathy can actually go. I don't think that either of them can truly relate to the way Katara's loss has moulded her very being. After three seasons of taking care of everyone around her, both on and off screen, The Southern Raiders is significant for being the first episode which allows Katara to unashamedly seek her own desires for her own sake. And when I say unashamedly, of course, <laughs> that's not to say the surrounding characters don't try to induce some reservations. You sound like Jet. You should write a book. How to offend women in five syllables or less. Ultimately, we reach a pivotal moment in which Katara, our girl who had to fill the void that her mother left behind, who had swallowed her pain and denied her happiness for the sake of others for nearly all of three seasons, who had been ceaselessly committed to the thankless task of serving the entire group's emotional needs with more patience and self-restraint than anyone else in her shoes would probably have had, who is all but canonically confirmed to be THE reason why her brother is far less traumatised from their mother's death than she is, who finally gets a whole episode to face her own trauma, to address her own emotional needs, without hesitation or compromise, and who is then treated to her brother and best friend slash future boyfriend's unsolicited opinions about it, on why she's making the wrong choice, why forgiveness is truly the better option, how it would only be to Katara's benefit if she would just choose the high road as she'd always done, the more laborious effort of tolerance and magnanimity and self-soothing that she must be truly so acquainted with by now. It is in this context that our girl, Katara, finally reaches her limit. Katara finally lashes out. Then you didn't love her the way I did. And of course, 
fans, having been present for Katara's entire emotional journey, being intimately aware of Katara's characterization, in fact having made so many tasteful jokes specifically about her unresolved trauma, how truly hilarious it is that Kaya's death hovers about Katara like a lingering shroud, of course the fandom would respond with nothing but the utmost respect and empathy and understanding that Katara has truly earned at this point. <laughs> Katara acting like she's the only one who ever knows what it's like to lose someone when Sokka lost the same mother and Aang lost his whole community. Sokka grew up in the exact same environment and she still bitched at him. Katara, I knew you wouldn't understand. All of Aang's dead friends. Am I a joke to you? I've had four of my guys killed and also my girlfriend killed, who I didn't like much, but that's still five friends killed. That's three more friends killed than you've had friends killed, so don't give me that moany fucking face, okay? God, I wanted Aang to accidentally burn Katara again. Jesus! Oh well, I love Katara, but Aang had his entire family slash culture wiped out by the Fire Nation. He understands far more than her. She said that Sokka didn't love her as she did, which is her prioritizing her loss. Bitch's entire culture was wiped out by the Fire Nation. Ironic how Katara stopped Aang in the desert, then she just tells him you wouldn't understand. I would have knocked her to- <laughs> Jesus Christ. I got nothing. <laughs> okay, maybe I might I might have something. Um, we got, we've got to wrap this up. We've got five minutes left. We've got to say something intelligent. Um, quotes. Quotes Quotes are good. Quotes sound intelligent, right? People like quotes. Let's put a, let's put a quote in here that's going to sound smart. In Maya Rodell's book, Dangerous Books for Girls, Rodell points out how it's still not uncommon for leading ladies in film and media to play little more than an auxiliary role to the men in typically male-driven stories. Writing, she is the wife, the mother, the girlfriend, the sassy best friend. She was, and is, the other. The romance genre, of course, being one of the few exceptions to consistently subvert the role that women often get to play on screen, particularly in regards to female narrative agency being the core driving force of the story. To quote, This in itself is audacious, because it asserts that women are worthy of a reader's interest, attention, and trust for hundreds of pages. That she is capable of a transformative journey. That she is more than an empty vessel. She is enough. This was, essentially, Katara's journey in the Southern Raiders. A journey which allowed Katara to confront her own demons, to pave her own path and seek her own answers, without wavering, apologizing, or deferring to the needs of somebody else, even for a moment, and who then managed to emerge all the stronger from it. In fact, one of the most powerful elements of the Southern Raiders is that, in the end, Katara decides to reject what the episode had seemingly set up as a moral dichotomy, the choice between exacting vengeance by way of taking life, or exercising forgiveness by way of sparing it. Katara solves the riddle by choosing to do both, as well as neither. She spares Yon Ra, but resolves to never forgive him. But I didn't forgive him. I'll never forgive him. But I am ready to forgive you. To me, the fact that so many viewers seem to default between seeing Katara as either a a historical a historical <laughs> A hysterical harpy who's allowing her emotions to cloud her better judgement and tear her away from the true, kind, selfless nature that she is. Or worse, a lovely angel that's just been temporarily corrupted by the toxic influence of a dark and intriguing bad boy. Both of these takes are so frustrating and disappointing to me precisely because of how much narrative agency they ultimately strip away from Katara in arguably the only episode in the show that is so wholly anchored around Katara's needs. Both of these takes ultimately whitewash or minimize Katara's agency by, again, reducing her role to what meaning we can draw from the relationships that she has to the characters around her, and mostly the men. It's, it's a tad depressing, just, just a tad. So this video is kind of an answer to all of those takes, which I feel are still a little lacking in nuance. Katara isn't a demon, and she isn't an angel. Too many reactions to her portrayal in the Southern Raiders boil down to a vilification of Katara over the all-too-human emotions which she displays, 
and too few actually pause to question whether what she says, how she feels, her need to confront Yon Ra, her fury towards her friend's objections, could at least be partially justified. In my opinion, both attempts to either villainize or infantilize Katara's choices in the Southern Raiders are two extremes which don't quite describe the full picture, and which to me kind of just misses the point. Mostly, it's just the, the lack of self-awareness that occasionally gets on my nerves sometimes. Not really, but you know. It's just it's like, you, you, you all know this. You know, like, I've seen all the funny little memes and the little jokes everyone makes making fun of Katara, specifically for her grief. You know, to, to ridicule Katara's pain specifically because it registers as over the top or excessive, and, and then to turn around and act like you're completely confused about why Katara might think her experience of grief might actually be slightly different to Aang's or Sarka's or anyone else's, you know. Nah, 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 no. You don't get to have it both ways. Stop doing Katara dirty. We already have plenty of sequel material that does it already. That's it for today. Um, thank you all for being so patient with me um, in dealing with my god-awful upload schedule. <laughs> I had some issues with recording and uploading this one as usual. <laughs> I hope it was still worth it. Oh, and a uh, big shout out to Barrett Astrom. Sorry, I I'm not going to be able to pronounce this name properly, but um, uh, Barrett Astrom, however you pronounce your name. Um, thank you for replying to my email and sending me the full copy of your paper on the difference in the way female and male pain and suffering is portrayed in film and media. It was actually quite informative and really well written and it really helped me in the research of my video. So really appreciate that you sent that to me and if you're watching this, uh, you wrote a really good paper and I'm gonna link it in the description, you know, just because I can. <laughs> Anyways, thanks for that. And um, yeah, I think that's it. I guess I'll see everyone next time. I'll see you all next time on Sneezy Reviews. Bye.